Okay, thank you for <coughs> coming. Thank you for being on time. And I have brought back the notes from last week's film, Bumblebee. As usual, they're on the table in alphabetical order. And I'll try to finish a couple of minutes before the time to give you time to retrieve yours. If you want to know what the equivalency would be between the excellent, very good, good, etc. that you find there and an actual grade, you can go to the announcements where the equivalency was posted. Okay? But it's, it's simple enough. Today, as well, we will be taking notes, writing comments about the new film, which is Christine, and we'll watch an extensive selection of scenes. Fewer scenes will be shown next week because I want to engage in a visual analysis of the style of this film. Before the film, I want to go back to the notes and excerpts from Jules, Ver Jules, Verne, Jules Verne's uh, The Master of the World, and also I want to review with you some of the notes that I placed in the page about Christine, comparing Christine to The Love Bug and to Bumblebee, because there are a lot of commonalities among these films, a lot of similarities in the treatment of the theme of humans and machines, where the machine is just a way to double the characters, to externalize whatever development or evolution the main characters go through. Okay? I'll distribute the pages for today's notes later, when the movie uh, comes up, and as usual, the attendance will be circulated. <clears throat> I already mentioned how this page is just a selection of quotes from the readings, where I try to simply highlight some features in the style of this novel, this science fiction novel about this magical vehicle that can fly, go underwater, on water, on the road, etc., called the uh, terror, and the themes connected to the representation of the technology, the negative, the pessimistic, the moralistic representation of the technology in this. So just to point out that you don't have to, if you've done the reading, you don't have to spend a lot of time on this page. But at the beginning, you find a section where you find a list of relevant themes. Because again, we're not reading for the sake of reading these things. We're trying to develop our expertise in the representation of technology, in the themes of technology and society in reference to the automobile. <clears throat> I added this uh, picture of uh, the notes I put on the board in the past. The first three are in reference to the style and, and the last is, is between theme and style. This is not high literature, right? This was supposed to be entertainment, a form of entertainment. It is commercial literature, meaning they're writing books. Jules Verne was writing books to sell as many as possible, and therefore he was also trying to write as many books as possible. So how does he achieved the result of producing an entertaining uh, novel, one that readers will want to read. Oftentimes, he uses, he relies on these rhetorical devices. Amplification, meaning that everything is made more dramatic, right? So amplification would be taking the same verbiage, the same language, and just adding, multiplying the number of adjectives or multiplying the number of ways to express the same concept. And oftentimes, <laughs> French literature from the 19th century, which was at the vanguard of fiction 
that was supposed to sell in the millions of copies is repetitious. Okay? So, amplification is one thing that you should be looking for that you'll find a lot in Jules Verne. Accumulation is another way to intensify the themes, the mood, uh, the effects of the narrative. Amplification is more of the same, right? Multiply the number of adjectives or metaphors just to communicate the same concept. Accumulation is multiply the, create a kind of series. Could be a list. Uh, if you say, for example, as he does at some point, that the terror is perceived by the fishermen of the Great Lakes as some kind of monster, then multiply the number of monsters you can compare the uh, machine to, the Kraken, the Leviathan, whales, etc. Right? It's more of the same, but with more variation compared to accumulation. Speculation is another typical device found in Jules Verne and many other uh, popular fiction books where the narrator will stop instead of just telling you what, what's happening, what the characters are doing, what the characters are saying, the narrator will stop and say, what is this? What is going to happen now? Will this happen? Is this, for example, at the beginning of the story, are these signs that a volcano is waking up on top of the Great Erie Mountain in North Carolina, and therefore this and that will happen. And you have the introduction of several scenarios, even though the narrative will only develop one, or develop none of those that were first introduced. So this is not a way to bring forward the, nar the narrative. It's a way to create suspense. It's a way to create tension by warning the reader that the narrative could go into many different directions. And again, you see that because it is a device applicable to popular fiction. You see it in movies as well. How many times the first part of a movie, the premise, uh, the, the setup of the story is suggestive of different storylines, but then only one is pursued. And it might not even be one of those presented initially. The last one I put on the board uh, for uh, thematic reasons, it is a moralistic narrative. So look for shortcomings of the characters that will be seen as sins, meaning things you can actually condemn and criticize, right? Because you might represent a character having shortcomings. Take Charlie in Bumblebee, for example. Of course, she's not perfect at the beginning but her shortcomings or imperfections are not represented as sins. They're represented as areas that she will work on and where she will develop skills that will replace the gaps in her personality, in her public persona, etc. For Vern, more often than not, we're talking about sins. And when you have a sin, then it, it you're, you're done, yes. You, you could recover in theory, but uh, you are a sinner and you will continue along the same way. Let me show you quickly an example of what I was saying before. This is a combination of several of the things we discussed, right? So the uh, machine, the terror is coming up from underneath the water, disturbing commercial traffic, fishing, etc., interfering with the regular uh, practices of a successful society, right? So interfering with progress, with growth, with power and empowerment of society. But after you have the representation of actual actions, it, the terror, 
darted like an arrow beyond the range of view, instead of continuing, now what? Are we going to follow the fishermen and look at the aftermath of their encounter with this uh, obscure, uh, threatening technology? Are we going to follow the terror and see where they go? No, instead, the narrator stops to contemplate, to open up this to different opinions. Would you, would you say as a result of the Paris introduction to the protagonist, it could become proverbially the white whale to the protagonist's Captain Ahab? Not, not really. I, I, I don't see much of a parallel. It, it could be argued, but uh, as a rhetorical exercise more than anything else, because the white whale is mostly absent. The white whale is just the external representation of something that is eroding your personality, your persona from inside, right? Uh, the, uh, the novel by Melville is about obsessions, right? And that obsession comes out in the form of the white whale. Whereas in this kind of novel, the technology itself is present a lot more. And this narrative is a lot more about interacting in one way or the other, indirectly or directly, with the technology. So it's not some um, reappearing reminder of the turmoil that you carry with you and that uh, could be externalized in different ways. Uh, clearly, even after you, uh, if, if, if you were able to destroy the whale, you would still remain like that. This is a bit different, I believe. Okay? So, the narrative stops, and then this is taking space on the page, really. Naturally, widely different opinions were held as to the nature of this object. And this is expanded, right? It's always a procedure of expansion. No hypothesis rested on any secure basis. Seamen were as much at loss as others. At first, sailors thought it must be some great fish like a whale. And notice how I try to show the direction in which this is expanding, how this is uh, a series, but then this first statement is opens up a different level, right? And instead of just saying, it's not a whale, we know it's not a whale, it goes into the whole analysis of what you can think and why this could or could not be a whale, right? So it goes from discarding the hypothesis of a whale to calling it a strange animal to speculating that it is not an animal, right? To comparing it to monsters, an unknown monster, and then expanding this to talk about the whole series of legendary dwellers in the deep, the krakens, the octopuses, the leviathans, uh, the famous sea serpent, okay? So this is a good example of how this is expanded without really making any progress in the telling of the story, just to create some uh, emotional effect with the readers. Okay. Let me move on to the comparison. And this is limited to a few suggestions, but more can be uh, thought of when you compare Bumblebee, The Lost Bag, and Christine. So, there is an essential moment in all of these films, which is the encounter, the time that the characters come in, into contact with the technology and when the bond is first developed, right? And I've limited my analysis to these three films, but you find it in other films as well. When we watched 
uh, Shia Leboeuf uh, coming into contact with Bumblebee uh, at Bobby Bolivia's dealership, then Bobby Bolivia himself was saying uh, that, that it's a kind of sacred bond between a car and a man, and, and it's the car that chooses the buyer as much as the buyer uh, picks the car, right? So you will see what happens with, between Arnie and Christine. Just to summarize the film, Arnie is kind of a loser in his high school, uh, the, the opposite of anybody cool and anything cool. But then he decides to get a car to improve his situation. And he will pick a car that is apparently as uncool as he is, apparently as out of place as he is, and then they will both change. He will restore the car, and while he's working on the car, the car is working on him, changing his personality, but also his physics. He will start wearing glasses, but then he will not need glasses because of the diabolical superpowers granted him by the car. He'll be able to see without glasses, he'll move differently, dress differently, become more confident, and little by little become more evil, as evil as the car by the end of the film. Charlie and Bumblebee, we've seen how the bond is struck at a time when, uh, during the series of mornings shown in the film, at a time when Charlie is hitting rock bottom and uh, has nowhere to go, uh, cannot uh, uh, finish the work initiated with her, uh, her father on, on the Corvette, cannot be acknowledged as a real human being by her family or her peers, she finds this car that is also forgotten, that is also being ignored. And that's where the bond is established, right? And then she herself works on the car finds out the car is Bumblebee, trains Bumblebee more than just restoring the car, and they both evolve. Jim and Herbie, same thing. Jim is at the end of his career, practically, and then when his career takes off, thanks to Herbie, he also starts working on himself. And we see how he is not perfect, that from a psychological, emotional, spiritual point of view, he needs to grow, and Herbie will help him uh, do so in, in several ways. Another commonality is that the car is not just a sentient being, but the theme of justice is somewhat attached in a prominent way to the vehicle, right? It is shown on the screen that they all have values in reference especially to justice, right? So Herbie shows that Thorndike knows and shows us that Thorndike, the owner, the British owner of the salon, of the dealership selling fancy cars, is bad, right? Is kind of evil and picks Jim because Jim is fair, because Jim has a sense of, that, of justice. Bumblebee, of course, comes out of a context where, in the war between Autobots and Decepticons, there are the good guys, the Autobots, and the bad guys. That's already clear from the beginning. And then, of course, Bumblebee, during the first encounter with Charlie, when, because of technological amnesia, he has forgotten that he's a warrior, is very much uh, a... a, a practitioner of peaceful interactions, right? So that is significant as well. And we'll see about Christine, you'll see that in the film. And as usual, especially for a horror film, there is a very simplified, a simplistic view of what is good and what is evil. And of course, evil must be punished or any uh, wrongdoing. Anybody who does wrong by either the owner of the car, Arnie, or the car itself, Christine, has to be punished. There is a certain amount of empathy that uh, strengthens the bond between machine and human. Of course, in the shop, Jim 
will pro be protective and defensive, right? Will try to defend Herbie from the violence uh, uh, applied by the uh, underlings of Miss Thorndike in the garage scene B B127 will connect with Charlie through empathy, not through words, right? And Arnie, you will see how Arnie sees this wrecked car and immediately feels affection for the car. And, and, and is, he is able to appreciate the hidden qualities in the car the same way that Arnie would like the people around him to appreciate the quality they don't see in him and he's not able to bring to the table or uh, project around himself again both in the family where Arnie is not really appreciated and at school outside. Keep in mind the various stages that we identified in Verne, which can be found differently, but can be identified here as well. The moment of temptation when you're tempted to embrace a technology or to adopt a car, the premonitions, the ominous signs that you find both in Verne, in Christine, and in other uh, stories, the moment of the seduction that you find expressed differently in a book like The Master of the World, but also in Christine. So narratives about technology in the form of a novel or a film tend to repeat similar patterns because they're all part of popular fiction. As I said, it's not literature or uh, high art. Jealousy is another common element to the card. So the uh, uh, card in Christine is jealous of Dennis, who's Arnie's best friend, and the one who, before Arnie bought the car, was protecting Arnie from the bullies, right? But then Christine takes the place of Dennis. And then Arnie gets uh, a girl, uh, and of course she's beautiful, uh, uh, everybody's after her at school, but Arnie gets her because this is the sign of her transformation, but then the car is jealous of uh, his girlfriend and tries to kill her. Herbie will be jealous of the red Lamborghini 400 GT uh, and will destroy it, even though when we see the red car, it's not a Lamborghini anymore, it's a Jaguar E because it was less expensive and easier to find a junked Jaguar in California than to destroy a Lamborghini. Uh, and. Uh, there is a scene we didn't look at, we didn't watch, where Bumblebee is left at home and neglected, therefore, by Charlie, who feels strong enough to just go out without Bumblebee. And Bumblebee will destroy the kitchen and the living area of Charlie's house, behaving like a pet that wants, to, wants more attention, right? There is also, in one way or the other, this sense that the machine is a messenger of a future technological apocalypse. That the technologies will bring some kind of dramatic change in society, right? And I've mentioned a few examples, the speech by Tennessee, the mechanic, in Herbie the Love Bag about the machines, about how we spend as humans so much time with the machines that the machines have taken some of our emotional, psychological uh, strength, energies, and have become more uh, humanized, right? And this is true of Bumblebee because at the end of the film, yes, humans and Autobots develop a kind of alliance but since Autobots have enemies, the Decepticons, humans will have the Decepticons as enemies. Same with Vern, where at the end, yes, the technology is destroyed, but might come back, and uh, uh, then you'll see uh, how powerful it is. 
Of course, all of these films have the same narrative arc for the protagonist, which is personal, psychological, and physical transformation of the protagonist after the encounter with the car, right? Arnie will turn into a cool guy, then into an evil guy, will go from being a nerd to being a greaser, which are uh, official categories, right, in films from that era, especially Charlie will become a hero and a confident woman. Jim will become not only a successful race car driver, but somebody you could marry because there is some morality lesson at play in the film by Disney at that point, right? Uh, he cannot be marriage material until he changes. It's not just about being a winner, okay? And as we've said many times, working on the car, working on the self, are just the same in these films. Same for the idea of getting to one's place. What is my place? What is my role? What is my voice? In different circles. The inner circle of family and friends and close friends. The outer circle of the school, society. The outer circles, plural, several circles, right? In all of these films, you have this idea that there is a space, which is a garage, could be a junkyard for uh, uh, some of these films, which is also a safe space for the protagonist, a, a space where they don't feel criticized, observed, ridiculed. And this is just to reinforce the idea that they're there by themselves, working on the car, working on themselves. This is true of Arnie. Both Arnie and Charlie go to a place which is in between a garage and a junkyard to work on their cars. And Jim and Tennessee have this house, which is not really a house. It is like a house in a garage. And of course, it used to be a fire station. The radio, uh, the easiest trick for these films is to have the car speak through the radio. So Christine, too, speaks through the radio. Bumblebee does that. Herbie does not do that, but uh, she or it is using the horn sometimes. This is how Christine will end up at the end of the film. However, the end is also promising that the world will never be the same because you see it apparently destroyed, but then little by little you see these pieces of metal that they're moving because Christine is trying to find its shape, get out of this uh, compact uh, cube of metal and be reborn as a car looking for the next victim. Okay, so that's it.